Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Ieli Ichile, and I would like to welcome all of you to the first of our four fall events, uh, the Black Culture Matters series. Uh, this evening is a special evening. I'm intensely excited to be here with you all. Uh, we've got a wonderful, wonderful talk planned, and we hope to talk with you all um, as well. Uh, so what we're going to do first is uh, take just a couple of seconds and allow um, a, a critical mass of folks to join us. Um, I see where the numbers are going up steadily. Um, this is quite a large event, so I'm going to give us just a minute or two, if you'll bear with us, just a minute or two to let more people uh, log in. That would be great. Okay, well, as we, <laughs> as, we, as we wait for the rest of our guests to join us, all of our, our community folks from all over, um, I'm going to open up um, our, our, our session with a verbal libation. So in the tradition of people of African descent, we acknowledge the, the community as widely as we can. Um, and that includes those who have gone before. We acknowledge their presence in our lives, the, the path that they set for us to be able to be here discussing these important matters with each other today. And so in, in lieu of having, you know, all of the other accoutrements that go with a libation, I'm going to just verbally express and set our intention for this evening. Um, I, I, for just a brief second, was playing a Nina Simone song. She's the face on our flyer for the event. Um, and I, I decided to reappropriate the song Feeling Good from, you know, Hollywood romantic comedies just for the, the evening uh, because I think the lyrics are so important and they're all about freedom. They're about a connection to land and nature. Um, and my intention for us this evening is that the, the life and the work of, of Nina Simone, that the passion of Nina Simone be an example for us, that her integrity and intensity with which she did her work uh, inform, inform us and, and our own work. May our words be strong medicine, not just mine, not just those words of our, our guest speaker this evening, but the words of all of you in the community, your contributions, your questions, your comments, that all of these words act as strong medicine to, to heal the intense and integral problems that we currently face in our world. Ashe. So uh, in light of the fact that we have acknowledged those who have come before us and, and the, the energy that guides this particular event, um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Ieli Ichile. I am currently a professor of history in the Department of Social Sciences at Prince George's Community College. I teach the courses in African history, African American history, African American studies, and African diaspora studies, so looking at Blackness globally. <clears throat> and because my work allows me to work on a micro level, a local level, and also talk about Blackness as a global phenomenon, I feel especially privileged and, and uniquely prepared uh, to be uh, to serve in this new role. So I've recently been appointed as the director of the African American Studies Institute at Prince George's Community College. I'm honored to be in this role. So this is my inaugural event. Um, and I would like to just quickly read the, thank you, the mission statement uh, for our institute. The mission statement of the African American Studies Institute at Prince George's Community College is to facilitate the critical study of the realities and possibilities of people of African descent, both in and beyond the Prince George's County learning community. Anchored in the Division of the Humanities, English, and Social Sciences at PGCC, the African American Studies Institute engages in digital outreach, educational programs, research, and community partnerships. The primary goal is to create spaces in which Black life ways are affirmed, justice is a top priority, and healthy futures are envisioned. So I invite you all to envision together with me. And once again, welcome to the first of our four part fall series entitled the Black Culture Matters series. Uh, I am amazed at the enthusiasm and the high energy around this event. Um, and I just wanna take this time to acknowledge a few folks before we get started. And as more of you are, are joining. Uh, firstly, I need to say that this project was made possible in part by a grant from Maryland Humanities through support from the Maryland Historical Trust in the Maryland Department of Planning, 
So I also must let you know that any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Maryland Humanities, the Maryland Historical Trust, or the Maryland Department of Planning. All right, so that said, I also want to acknowledge that we are also hosted and sponsored by Prince George's Community College writ large, the hum Humanities, English, and Social Sciences Division. I want to give a special thank you to the Dean of our division, Dr. Nicole Courier, also the chair of my department, the chair of social sciences, Dr. Corey Brown, and so many other people who um, have supported me in this new role and, and bringing all of this together. So a heartfelt and sincere thank you. All right, so without further ado, wow, we've got folks from everywhere. This is, this is brilliant, this is, this is amazing. Um, so let's get into it um, now that you're here. Uh, I want to welcome uh, our, our speaker for this evening. I'm so, so proud and honored to uh, introduce you all to Dr. Karanja Keita Carroll. Dr. Carroll is uh, currently an adjunct associate professor of Black and Latinx Studies at Baruch College, the City University of New York. As an advocate of prison education, Dr. Carroll has also taught held workshops and or lectured at a number of correctional facilities, particularly in the tri-state area. Dr. Carroll is an African-centered social theorist who is thoroughly committed to the African-centered imperative, one that is grounded in the creation and utilization of culturally specific frameworks in order to understand and create solutions for humanity. His publications have appeared in the Journal of Pan-African Studies, Western Journal of Black Studies, Journal of the International Society of Teacher Education, Critical Sociology and Race, Gender and Class. He's also got articles and chapters in numerous edited volumes. He's everywhere, he's prolific. Uh, Dr. Carroll is also an organizer with the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, the Northeast Political Prisoner Coalition, and Black Alliance for Peace. Dr. Carroll is fundamentally committed to academic excellence and social responsibility, as originally artic articulated by the National Council for Black Studies. I can personally attest everyone uh, to the fact that Dr. Carroll is a gifted classroom teacher. He is a dedicated mentor. He is a thoughtful, lifelong student. He interacts with the people he will talk with you about this evening. He studies with them. And he is also a supportive colleague of yours truly and others. Um, and so after the lecture, I'm going to ask Dr. Carroll to respond to an image of my choosing. He has not seen this image before. I've, he doesn't know what it will be. Um, I'm just going to get him to kind of briefly speak extemporaneously about what I show him, the, the image, uh, and then uh, we're going to open up the chat and, and invite questions and comments and responses from all of you so we can get a dialogue going. So without further ado, and thank you once again, everyone, I would like to welcome Dr. Karanja Keita Carroll. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am honored to be the first speaker in this uh, lecture series. Um, so I'm thankful to Dr. Chelly for believing that I would be able to pull this off. Um, I'm also thankful to the African American Institute and uh, Prince George's County uh, Community College for, you know, supporting this project because this is important work that we're going to try to do, um, at least an important conversation that we're going to try to have tonight. I have a PowerPoint presentation um, that Someone can hear me? Let me. Better now? All right. Um, so I'm going to have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to try to move through this um, as quickly as possible so that we have more time for question and answer because I'm not the lecturer type. That's not my style. It's about discussion. So um, let's try to move this, this through and move to my PowerPoint. And here we are, everyone can see this, we're good? All right, thank you. All right, so celebrating while Black from Juneteenth to Black August. Dr. Chelly has already told you who I am, so I won't talk about myself anymore. I might towards the end, but that's good for now. Um, you know, I think when we deal with celebration and holidays, and things of that nature. It's necessary for us to deal with questions of culture, and it's necessary for us to deal with question of po questions of politics. And culture is essential to the work that African-centered scholars do. Um, Wade Nobles provides a definition of culture that is uh, foundational for, for a lot of this work. According to Wade Nobles, culture is a general design for living 
and patterns for interpreting reality. Way Nobles argues that we therefore understand culture on two levels. That is a surface structure of culture. That is what is expressed and apprehended uh, through the five senses. So if you can see it, if you can taste it, if you can hear it, it can possibly be a manifestation of culture. But there's also a deeper level of culture and that is that deep structure. Those are the ideas, the philosophies, the explanations that undergird culture. And when we think about our holidays from Juneteenth to Black August, we should be concerned with culture because it's fundamentally about bringing our culture to the center of our existence as we live in the midst of white supremacy, live in the midst of this nation and what it represents to us. Um, and, you know, the next question for me is, you know, ain't it all political? It is all political. And I think sometimes we just need to get to the nitty gritty of what the term political, its root politics is all about, all right? It's fundamentally about power. It's fundamentally about relationship between groups. So when we think of African people expressing their culture, that is a political act because we are pushing back against a society, a nation that tries to make us be something that we are not. Um, and therefore we celebrate. We celebrate our existence. We celebrate all that we do because it's reflective of our culture. It is reflective of the politics that we bring to say that we exist and we are gonna continue to exist because we have relied upon our culture in order to exist. So, you know, I actually have this t-shirt. My wife got this t-shirt for, for me. We both have a, um, a, 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 this t-shirt. And I think that this, you know, represents, you know, these, the function of culture, the political nature of culture. And it tells us a narrative about what Juneteenth is. If you look at this picture, it tells us, no, we're not talking about July 4th, 19, uh, 1776. No, we're not talking about uh, January 1st, 1863. But yes, we're talking about January 19th, 1865. That is Juneteenth, all right? And if you notice, there's a red line that goes through do July 4th, there's a black line that goes through July, um, January 1st, and there's a green line that underlines June 19th, all right? What is the symbolism here? The symbolism here is that red, black, and green, that flag, that, that Pan-African flag that we get from Marcus Garvey in the, in the UNIA. And that symbolism is, is, is so important for the blood of our people, for our, for our blackness, and for the green, for the land. And I find it so important that June 19th is underlined because we are on top of that land. We are growing out of that land. We are existing as free people on this land. Um, and then we have Black August. Why Black August? Black August as a month of resistance, all right? We can go through all of the different historical events that have taken place in August. All of the people who have been born in the, in, the, in the month of August and their relationship to this question of resistance. But August becomes this important month for us to think about resistance. August is also important for us because it's a time when we can think about rebirth. And therefore we ask the question, what is Black August? In a nutshell, we wanna know that Black August is a celebration. It is a, a time of acknowledgement where we have folks who were incarcerated, who decided to take time out to rethink and reevaluate their process. And this image on the left um, goes through the four principles connected to Black August. That is of fasting, of studying, training, and preparing to fight. That is one fast from sunup to sundown. If you're unable to do that, then maybe you decide not to drink coffee for the month of August. Maybe you decide not to eat red meat for the month of August. But you also make sure that you study because those brothers on the inside were studying um, the works and the, 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 the con contributors to African history and African-American history. And, you know, as a member of the Malcolm X grassroots movement and as a, a, a college professor, I hold study groups during the month of August. I'm holding one study group with a group of former students where we're, we're reading the work of George Jackson. I'm holding another study group with the, um, with the Malcolm X grassroots movement where we've been reading the work of um, our comrade, uh, Brother Edinacci and his book on free, entitled Free the Land. But again, we use this time to study. There is a mental type of study that's taking place, and there's also a physical type of preparation that goes on when it relates to one's, to, when it relates to training, all right? 
Um, many of you, I, I'm not sure how many of you know, but um, during this month of August, there is the Black August um, 100 mile, I forgot the actual name of it, but it's a 100 mile challenge where the goal is to find out if you, to, to try to walk, to ride a bike, or to run at least 100 miles within the month of August. Now I'm at about 60 miles, so we'll see what happens if I can pull off the, the, this 40 miles over these next couple of days. But again, connected to Black August is the need to not only train your mind, but to train your physical body, and you are training in preparation to fight. Training, training and preparation to be able to defend your existence. And this is essential. But when we deal with Black August, we have to deal with this person by the name of George Jackson. Because this man by the name of George Jackson was extremely influential in bringing about and in raising consciousness um, within the California penal system. And he was a victim of the state because they murdered him. And due to his murder, others became conscious and connected and began to move along and push the work that he was doing. George Jackson was, 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 a, was is who I'll talk about a little bit later as eventually a politicized prisoner, but George Jackson wrote books. He wrote Soledad Brothers, the prison, his prison letters. He wrote Blood in My Eye. And these are points of reference that we need to be returning to, to think critically about our moment that we are currently in as it relates to the month of August, but also as it relates to electoral politics, as, as, uh, also as it relates to our relationship uh, in regards to police violence, so forth and so on. But this in a nutshell is what Black August is about. Um, but Black August is also connected to this idea of the politics of incarceration. A fundamental component of Black August is recognizing that political prisoners exist, that there are people who are incarcerated clearly for political prisoners. Sundiata Coley, I'll talk about him a little bit um, in, in a few seconds, but he says that a political prisoner is an individual who has been jailed either for his or her beliefs or for his or her speech or for basically his political ideas and concepts, meaning that there are people who are incarcerated because they have ideas that are critical of the state and that go against the state. And we think that this is just something that took place in the 60s, but we have political prisoners who are currently locked up right now, and we have people being incarcerated currently who are clearly political prisoners. And I'll explain that in a second. Leonard Peltier, um, an indigenous political prisoner, um, stated that a political prisoner is someone, uh, um, a political prisoner is someone who is someone out of fighting for his people or his people's rights and freedoms and is prisoned for that alone. All right, so we have political prisoners, we have politicized social prisoners, and we have prisoners of war. These are three concepts that are important. When you talk about someone like George Jackson, who went to, went, who was locked up for social reasons, he went in as a social prisoner, he transitioned into a politicized prisoner, and he eventually was a political prisoner when he was um, murdered. Um, those pr prisoners of war are people who have taken up arms against the state in order to defend the existence of their people. And we have folks who are incarcerated who fit all of these categories. The point is that Black Order August allows us to reconnect and allows us to understand the importance of political prisoners and understanding the politics of incarceration. Because people are not locked up just because they commit a crime. There's a political connection to why folks are locked up. And the history of this is connected to what we have right here. This is a really important book um, that is entitled The COINTEL Pro Papers. And it outlines some of the stuff that I just, that, that's laid out here as it relates to the historical um, uh, function of COINTEL Pro. And we don't need to go into this in extreme detail, but I will just say, pick up the book, understand the history, and make the connections and find out why Black August is important and why uh, political prisoners exist um, today. So. Jaleel Muntakim. Jaleel Muntakim is currently in Shawangun Correctional. Um, he's been there since 1974, uh, convicted of shooting two NY, um, uh, NYPD police officers. But Jaleel was a member of the Panthers. Jaleel is an active um, advocate for social change. And Jaleel is someone who should be free because 
he's no threat to society, but he's locked up for political reasons. He's locked up because of his affiliation to the Panthers. He's locked up because of being accused of trying to attempt the murder of um, police officers, but he's inside and he actually had COVID. And um, back in, I think it was June, he had actually had COVID and the, the state had said that he should be released. And the district attorney comes around, the attorney general comes around and says, no, we can't be released. He actually has a court date coming up in, in, um, in September. And hopefully y'all can Google Jaleel and figure out the ways that you can support him. Right here is Sundiata Okoli. The majority of us know who Asada Shakur is. We know Asada, but many of us don't know about Zayd Malik Shakur. Many of us don't know about Sundiata Okoli. Uh, Zayd Malik was taken out by the police in uh, 1973, but Sundiata actually got away for a moment, but he was eventually captured. And obviously we know that Asada was captured, but Asada was able to be to get free. Um, Sundiata is, I think about 84 years old right now, in um, Cumberland Federal Correctional Facility, right there in Maryland. Um, he's no threat to society. Um, and if you know his history, you know that he went to Prairie View A&M University, studied mathematics, knows computers, technology, um, had the chance to go work for NASA. Instead, he went to New York and worked for some computer firms, eventually got hooked up with the Panthers and started doing this work around the liberation of our people. And he was in that car with Asada, traveling down the New Jersey Turnpike. And at this point, he's locked up in Cumberland Federal Correctional Facility. No threat to society, no threat. H. Rat Brown, we know H. Rat Brown. H. Rat Brown, a, a former uh, member of the Civil Rights Movement, connected to organizations like SNCC, connected to organizations like the Panthers. H. Rat Brown is accused, uh, is accused of shooting a Fulton County Sheriff deputy. Um, back in 2000, you know, and his son and others are working to bring attention to this case so that it can be reevaluated because he's incarcerated for political reasons. He's not incarcerated because he's done anything wrong. The only thing that H. Rap Brown has done wrong is be a threat to the society because of his ideas. Mumia Abu Jamal, we know about Mumia, or we at least should know about Mumia Abu Jamal. Mumia Abu Jamal, um, former Panther member of the National um, Association of Black Journalists out of Philly, accused of killing a, a Philadelphia police officer. Um, the evidence tells us that he didn't do it, but yet and still the state wants to keep him locked up. Matulu Shakur, Matulu Shakur, um, godfather of Tupac. I mean, Matulu, uh, you know, is a doctor, okay? A, 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 a homeopathic doctor. When he was connected with the Panthers, he was working to get, to get people off of drugs using homeopathic methods. But yet and still, his connection to the Panthers, his connection to the Black Liberation Army has found him inside a correctional facility locked up. And Russell Maroon Schultz, let me see. We have one more after, after this. Russell Maroon Schultz, um, another uh, political prisoner out of Philadelphia. Um, his story is a, is a wonderful story because he's called Maroon because he was able to escape numerous times. Um, but again, he, per, he, served no, he served no threat and has historically served no threat um, to, the, to, 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 the, to anyone except the state because of his ideas and because of what he expressed as it relates to freedom and justice for our people. And the final person I'll talk about is um, of the old guard is Sophia Bukhari. Um, Sophia Bukhari is, is a, um, a wonderful woman who is no longer with us, but she has done and she did do tremendous work in bringing the plight of political prisoners to the forefront. Her, she herself was a political prisoner and when she got out, she said that she was gonna make sure that she didn't leave her comrades behind and she was going to bring attention. It's because of Sophia Bukhari, because of Jalil Muntakim, and because of others that we have what is known as the Jericho Movement. 
probably the, the, the largest organization within the United States that is concerned with political prisoners. Um, she has a, a, a beautiful collection of essays that y'all should consider um, 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 looking and reading and purchasing and understand who Sophia, who Safia was and what she was about because she's a beautiful example of sisters who are committed to the freedom of her people. I mentioned earlier that like, you know, we think of these political prisoners as if this is something in the past. And we think of the fact that, you know, th this is behind us, but we need to recognize that the FBI has created a bogus concept known as black identity extremists. And this brother, Akeem um, Balagoon was a victim of this, uh, uh, this, this, this concept. The FBI wants us to believe that if you are connected to Black Lives Matters, if you're connected to any type of social justice movements around issues of race, that therefore you could be a black identity extremist and therefore you are a threat to society and therefore we're gonna go through your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, go through all of it. And if we find enough step that, stuff that we believe to be a threat, we're gonna lock you up. Now, Rakeem beat this, but we need to be mindful that this government is still thinking of ways to incarcerate, and criminalize black folks for thinking critically about their existence within this nation. Um, at the end of the day, let's just read what this says, face reality. There are political prisoners in the US and they deserve to be free. And this is an old, um, um, an old poster that came about. Some of these folks are, are released. Um, some of them are transitioned on and are no longer here with us. But we have to recognize that we have political prisoners and we have to understand and utilize this month of August to remember and bring about their names and bring attention to them so they are not forgotten. As Sophia, as Sophia would say, they are not left behind. Um, two projects that I'll, I'll talk about really quickly and then I'm done. How am I looking on time? Am I at like 10 minutes? Yeah, just about 10. Okay, good, because I'm about to be done in about three. Two projects that, that, that um, I'm a member of the Black Alliance for Peace. If you go on Instagram, um, you'll see that we have a number of videos up that are connected and explaining um, some uh, political prisoners that you should be mindful of. Some of the folks that I've talked about, some of the folks I haven't talked about. Secondly, on Sunday, there is the Black August concert. The Black August concert um, is, is a concert hosted by the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement and the Movement for Black Lives. But the Malcolm X grassroots movement years ago was, was pulling together this concert and it was about bringing attention to these political prisoners and recognizing the importance of hip hop as a mechanism to bring attention to the realities that, that African people experience. And therefore, I'm suggesting y'all to take a part in the, in the concert. It's Sunday. And if you go to blackaugusthiphop.com, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Pacific. I'm sure you will, you will, you will, you'll be treated to a good performance, a good series of performances. Um, that's who I am. That's how you can contact me. And now let's get to the good stuff in the question and answers. Thank you. Am I on? Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Carroll. Um, so this was really, really brief, and obviously you all, thank you again. Um, you, you have kind of unwittingly been drawn into actually doing what people do around Black August, which is celebrating through storytelling and raising awareness. That is really um, one of the primary goals of this particular celebration. I thought it was really important for us to, to do this part. Uh, because because it's August. And so I did try to push for it, us to have our first date for these events take place in August. Um, I'm going to show you a photo, as I said I would, Dr. Carroll, so you're not done talking yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I will, I'll definitely do that. I'm going to show you a photo and I'm going to ask you to respond to it. It's, it's um, let's see if I can, let me screen share. Share my screen. Okay. All right. Can you see it? Uh. <laughs> okay. Uh. I hope everyone can see that. Okay. So, off the cuff, what are we looking at? 
what do you see here? What is the significance of this particular photograph? I mean, this is this is George. Um, sorry, I'm 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 going to try to talk, up, but I'm thinking as well. This is George, um, and I don't know exactly when this was taken, but we see George smiling, and mm -hmm. the interviews that I've seen of George, um, he always was not happy, but he was at peace. And him being at peace meant that he realized that he was incarcerated. He realized that these folks were trying to, 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 to take him, take his life, take everything from him, but yet he still was resilient. And his resiliency allowed for him to smile. You know, George was reading some of the most radical thinkers of, 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 of his day. And as he read those thinkers, he realized that he might be physically incarcerated, but that wasn't going to stop him from being. That wasn't going to stop him from living and existing and, and learning and sharing what he, what he, what he knew. Um, that's what I see. I see someone who is existing and is existing happily because this person knows that he can continue to do the work that he was brought here to do. All right. Thank you for that assessment. Um, so I'm gonna, let me stop. So, so <clears throat> I, I don't know the year of this picture. I have to go back. I just took this from blackpast.org. So that, that photograph is courtesy of blackpast.org, which is a huge resource. We're linked to blackpast.org through the Prince George's Community College Library. So I use their resources um, in, in class. But I'm glad that you all noted, uh, you Dr. Carroll and also some of our community uh, in the chat, notice that he's smiling. That was what made the picture stand out to me. And you and I had a discussion <clears throat> ahead of tonight's event about the role of joy and celebrating as, it, you know, as, as a connection, as it having a connection to politics, but what is the role of black joy? So I get to ask the first question since, you know, it's me. <laughs> but my question, my first question for you, and then I, there are some really good questions in the chat, but my question is really about uh, this notion that that there is no place for black joy in our movement. We've got to be solemn and we've got to be serious and we've got to own, you know what I mean? Like, is there a place for celebration, actual celebration and, and joy within our movements? What is the, what does that mean? Is it, is it a cop out? Is it, is it cooning? Is it, what is that? I mean, listen, <laughs> um, I'm not going to tell you I'm not going to talk about cooning or not, um, but <laughs> what, I'll, what I'll say is this, like, as African people, we are, as I stated, we are resilient, and that resiliency and our ability to bounce back and bounce out of horrible positions means that we have to be joyful, it means that we have to be happy, and we have to love what we do, and if we love what we do, why are we going to be bothered and upset about it? Um, so I don't, I think that there is a place for, for, for black joy. I think that there is a place for us to, to, to be mindful of what we're doing, but also recognize that when we have freedom on our mind, we got to be happy about doing the work to get there. We just can't get, be happy when we are free. It's the process of getting free that allows us to be happy because it's affirming what we're doing. If it's, if it's negative and, 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 and and downtrodden and all that other garbage, what's the point? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that some people want to make this work about being a robot with no emotions. And I think sometimes we don't value our emotions. We don't value, we don't value our happiness. And we need to, you know, I mean, like, we're, we should be happy that we are waking up and able to do this work. I mean, I know that I am. Because I enjoy what I do. Right. Absolutely. Agreed. So um, there's so much more we can talk about. Um, obviously, and we find joy through our culture. We find joy through the food we cook at these holidays, through the t-shirts the, the we wear, the art we produce, right? Um, so I really thank you for that because I, I agree. And I think that there is uh, there's a mental health component, an emotional component, a, a healing and a therapeutic component to the Black culture around holidays. Um, that I really, you know, I'm always thinking about, but I want to get to some of these questions. So let me scroll up and get to, let's see, what was one of the first ones? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, do you think that the, no, 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 there was one before that. Uh, it's George Jackson to answer D's question. Uh, the year of the picture, I am not exactly sure of, and I have to get back to you on that. Um, bu- 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 bu. The political efforts, do you think the political efforts to make Black people afraid of liberatory politics, um, are there Are there political efforts? Obviously, we've, you've discussed FBI, COINTELPRO, being put on lists, right? Um, which is obviously not a new strategy, but it doesn't seem like Black radical politics are in the mainstream right now in the way that they were in perhaps George Jackson's day. I'm interested in showing people a, a spectrum of Black political perspectives. So this is definitely the radical end of that spectrum. What are your what are your thoughts? Is there more that you want to share about kind of efforts to push black radical thought out of the mainstream? I mean, I think so I I we'll go back to COINTELPRO because I think COINTELPRO um provides an important foundation and I didn't talk about COINTELPRO in a lot of detail, but I'll explain. COINTELPRO is a counterintelligence program put together by the FBI. COINTELPRO um, functions as a means of infiltrating organizations in order to work to, to put organization members and these organizations against one another so they would self-destruct. COINTELPRO worked by trying to assassinate folks, trying to incarcerate folks, trying to force people out of the, the, um, the, the country, or uh, trying to destroy people's character. And those four approaches is what COINTELPRO um, attempted to do. And we see that this was taking place as it relates to the Panthers, the Black Liberation Army, and other folks who were in the 60s. And anyone who studies this might be afraid that that's going to happen again. And I would argue that when you look at Black identity extremists, it's the same exact thing that's going on. You're, you're politicizing and you're criminalizing folks who are concerned with freedom and justice around issues of race. Um, and when I talk to my students about this, some of my students are visibly shook and scared. And they're like, you know, I want to do this work, but I'm concerned about this. But, you know, I was at the ceremony for something a few years ago, and the brother was speaking, said, sometimes we got to risk it all. And when we risk it all, that means that we know the work that we're doing is for truth, justice, and righteousness. And we stand on that, and we move forward. But the state functions to scare us so that we don't resist. And as long as we're scared, the state is going to continue to destruct, destroy us as a people. And that's what we're dealing with. So I think the state might try to work against us, but it's up to us to realize that we're standing on, as somebody mentioned, we're standing on this foundation of Ma'at. And that's the work that we need to be doing. Thank you. We have another comment. We had a comment from Crystal that the smile in the photograph could also indicate that while he's in a terrible situation under oppressive circumstances, the message he was trying to fight for and the work he was going forward in part by virtue of his circumstances, uh, that's servant leadership in action. So I think that definitely aligns with what you were saying. Do you think the efforts to make Black people afraid, uh, well, has been effective? How has studying this impacted you, yourself, um, your position in this movement? So I'll, I'll explain again, you know, I didn't want to talk about everything in that presentation because the question and answer would give me the context to talk about some of the stuff. So in part of my, my bio, um, Dr. Shelley has said that, you know, I've been doing work in, pr- in correctional p- facilities for some time. Um, when I was in graduate school at Temple University, um, I got a letter. Um, I didn't get a letter. The department got a letter saying that they were looking for folks to come and, you know, do workshops at a local prison. And I said I was going to do it. And this had to have been, um, I don't know, maybe 2001, 2002. And I started doing these workshops around African culture um, at, a, at a correctional facility in Pennsylvania. That's slipping from my mind right now. Um, when I was teaching in upstate New York, I did work at Shawangan Correctional. Um, they had a beautiful program known as the African Cultural Awareness Program. And while I was there, I was introduced to these brothers who were locked up, some of them for 25 years to life. And they were coming together weekly to meet with me to talk about African history and culture. 
and it made me make these connections and made me ask some further questions. And while I was um, working in upstate New York teaching uh, at SUNY New Paltz, I was introduced to Jaleel Muntakim because Jaleel Muntakim at that time had gone through um, the prison education program in sociology at, my, at that school that I was teaching at. And I just started to make all of these connections and it, this, they, this stuff became real for me. It became the, 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 the realist when I was asked to teach a class at Sullivan Correctional um, Facility. And in the middle of the term where I'm teaching, one of the brothers in there says like, you know, do you, can, can Robert Seth Hayes come into a session? And my mouth drops because Robert Seth Hayes was a political prisoner um, and he wanted to sit in on my class. And I was like, yes, brother, let's come in. And him and I taught a class together um, uh, 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 that day. Um, and Robert Seth Hayes was released and sad to say he passed away, made a transition in January, excuse me, in December of last year. But this stuff for me has become personal because I've made connections to these folks. One of, um, I've made connections to, to, to the former political prisoners where this is not just some theoretical, historical type of thing. These are living people who are willing and able to talk and share with me their stories. And then I share those stories with folks that I, that I deal with. Right now, I, I, I weekly spend, spend time with, um, spend, spend time with Otri Latulu, a former um, political prisoner who was locked in uh, uh, Trenton State Correction for I think 27 years, 22 of those years, he was in solitary confinement, all right? And I spend time with him and we talk and we share ideas and he imparts with me the knowledge that, that, that he has. So this is, this is not an academic exercise. This is fundamentally about understanding the experiences of people who put time into trying to change the conditions that we're in and we cannot leave them behind. We cannot forget about them. We need to recognize that they are living and, here, and still here with us. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, so that's an excellent personal story. So you've, I mean, it's, it's basically you've experienced and interacted with these people in the flesh and that had an impact on, on you, that they're real. These aren't just abstract stories that we read about. Sometimes we make things very academic. Um, and, and so having mentors who have been locked in prison for decades, they may, they sacrificed their freedom in their 20s, you know, in their teens uh, behind a cause. It, it really can have an impact on you. So as someone who has done similar work, I definitely um, agree. I'm going to try to get to a couple more questions. Gwen makes a point. Anger can be motivation, but joy takes us further and keeps us in the fight. Uh, that is absolutely true. Um, of course, Black, uh, Black August is, is a celebration of and an observance of the struggle of political prisoners, but it is also really um, a month that has had significance for Black people for a long time, right? Many of our movements, we can talk about the Haitian Revolution, we can talk about Marcus Garvey and his first UNIA convention in 1920, exactly 100 years ago um, at Madison Square Garden. And, and, you know, so this month really is a significant time um, for African people getting free from slavery, colonization. Um, this is an international celebration of emancipation. It's connected to Juneteenth, right? When you talked about Sundiata Akolai, um, I thought about his, his days at Prairie View. There's a really good chance he celebrated Juneteenth. And Juneteenth is also about storytelling and remembering the emancipation efforts of Black people who forced their emancipation. It wasn't just Union soldiers riding around saying you're free all around Galveston, Texas. It was people of African descent who communicated and had their own communication network, understanding that this is a freedom, a right that they had won, and that they deserve to live as free people. And then the spreading of that celebration around, around the nation from there in solidarity. Um, so yeah, so I think finding joy is not about frivolity and, and being trivial. Um, music, and, and storytelling and, and creating spaces for joy is an expression of freedom. Being free and behaving as free humans is an act of resistance in and of itself in the face of dehumanizing um, uh, oppression. So I think that's really important. Um, we've both been asked to talk about the ways in which we find joy in seriousness. 
Um, will any of these people be released? Some of them are being released in our lifetime. Do you want to take the joy and seriousness question first? Um, no, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'll let you want to talk about your vegetable garden? Oh, yeah, I, I, I could do that. Actually, I will, but, but I do want to, the, the point about will pe folks be released, um, yes, but not all of them, to be honest with you. Um, and there are certain people who won't be released because of their connection to Asada Shakur. The fact that Asada was able to get free and is living freely in Cuba means that people who are connected to her, I don't believe are going to be free because they are, because of, because of what Asada symbolized. And, and they're connected to that, um, that, that to, to her as that symbol. So that's the honest, uh, the, my honest perspective on that. However, that doesn't mean that we don't fight to try to get them free. That's what, you know, we don't forget folks and we don't leave anyone behind. We're still concerned with trying to get information about their cases out, bring attention to them, and also try to work to allow this legal system to do what it needs to do in the interest of our people. And we realize that we can't trust the legal system, but we should know the legal system and we should be using it to our advantage. Um, as far as the, the, how do we find joy and seriousness, you know, um, I've been teaching via Zoom this whole, whole summer. Before I go into class and after I get out of class, I go outside in my garden and look at my vegetables and talk to my plants. And I get joy there. I get joy by watching, you know, these plants grow, providing me with food that I'm eating or food that I'm giving to my neighbors. You know, I, you know, gave, I gave some acorn squash to one of my neighbors the other day. The brother rolls around, knocks on my door and says, oh, my wife had these eggplants. That's, that brings me joy. Sharing and receiving and having these reciprocal types of, um, types of relationships. Um, but I also think that, I, don't, I mean, like I said before, I enjoy being an educator. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy sharing what I know. And that brings me joy. Having this conversation with y'all brings me joy. So I don't, I, I, I think, you know, joy is, 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 is not really complicated for me. Um, it, it, it's just about realizing that, yes, this is serious. We are at war. We're trying to survive. But in the process, we're going to do it with freedom on our minds. And if we do it with freedom on our minds, we got to be happy. We got to have joy because we know that failure is not an option. Yeah. Um, so a couple more questions. You answered a few in the chat, actual, actually, Dr. K Carol. Um, so, the, so there's a, an important question on the table about infiltration of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there's another question kind of closer to the topic, which is about how this movement's influenced visual art in terms of themes, colors, and symbolism, kind of getting back to the cultural question. Um, and, and then the third one, and you can take these in whatever order you choose. Uh, do you ever consider leaving the United States to access greater freedom? Uh, no, I don't. A lot, since we brought up Garvey. No, I, all of those I, um, I, I do not uh, consider leaving. Um, I am a member of the New African Independence Movement. I believe that we are new Africans and we de deserve, de deserve land in order to determine how we would like to move forward as a nation. As one of my mentors and elders, Baba A.K. states, the United States is a prison nation, all right? There are various nations locked up here. New Africans are a nation, um, Chicanos are a nation, Native American nations exist, so forth and so on. And therefore, we deserve a right to be here. And we also deserve a right to be here as long as the indigenous peoples agree that we could be here. So no, I'm not trying to leave. Um, the I don't remember all the questions. So what were the, the other two? The, Maybe uh, one at a time. The, the movement and its influence on the visual arts. Um, I, you might have to answer that one. <laughs> I, um, that, yeah, I'm, I'm going to let you answer that. Okay. Um, and I, because I, I, I can't speak for visual arts, um, but I can speak for like music and things of that nature. You know, like, in my classes, I use, I primarily use nothing but conscious music because I believe that music 
has a way to transmit information and transmit stories that sometimes you're not going to get by reading a book. There's a beautiful song by um, uh, M1 and, and another artist who's slipping me right now. I'm sorry that I'm slipping on the, the, the artist's name, but it's called Be Sekou. And in that song, Be Sekou, that song is about Sekou Odinga, who is currently released and um, a former political prisoner. He's the lead organizer with the Northeast Political Prisoner Coalition, which I'm also a member of. And the song is also about Jalil Muntakim, who I've already talked to you about. And I use that song to talk about political prisoners and introduce um, the, the uh, political prisoners to my students. So music is a, is a necessary mechanism to transmit information, transmit culture, and also use as a, as a, as a learning tool. And I mean, you, we just finished talking about, um, not talking, but in the beginning, we were playing Nina. When you study Nina Simone's life, you see this person who went through all these different moves in trying to understand who she was and she did it through her music, all right? And th th so, so, so yes, I'd argue that music as an aspect of culture is a necessary means of transmitting who we are. But I'll let you take the visual arts component. Okay. Okay, I, I didn't, I, I don't want to talk too long, but I think, again, we really, really must study uh, Garvey's movement and the Universal Negro Improvement Association, um, because wherever you see Black Lives Matter, wherever you see Kwanzaa and other Black holidays and celebrations and observances, you're going to see the red, the black, and the green. You saw it on the t-shirt at the beginning of Dr. Carroll's presentation. Um, that is the Pan-African flag. That is the flag that represents people of African descent globally, um, as a global community with a, with a shared destiny and a shared struggle. And so that essentially becomes the kind of color scheme for most of the things that we are doing when we are serious about culture and serious about advancement um, as, a, as a race, as a group of people in the world. Um, and and the, the most beautiful and most intriguing aspect of all of the Black celebrations to me is the visual plane, is the fact that um, there, are, there are always kind of these reference to Africa um, African culture that is, uh, you know, obviously sometimes controversial. There's a reference to the land and our connection with the earth um, because there is also kind of always an acknowledgement of the original stewards of this land, the original First Nations people um, in our movements because we're sensitive to that, um, the fact that this is colonized, captured land. Um, it, the, the spawning of like so much artistic work um, around our celebrations is kind of just part and parcel of who we are. We can go back to Africa and see the masquerade traditions and, and, and the, the, the material arts, the plastic arts, the, the visual arts of just what it means to celebrate. Um, even we look at murals and t-shirts, you know, all of these things really speak back to creating spaces in which to express and affirm Black humanity. And I think that's really important because, and that's why our series, our event series is what it is, my goal was instead of kind of bringing people together to kind of continue to shout that our lives matter to people who continue to deny it um, and to continue to kind of limit our life chances. Um, my goal is to think about ways in which people that have descent have affirmed their humanity over time, continue to do so amongst themselves. What are the things we do to affirm our humanity and remind ourselves of the human value we have? Um, <clears throat> and visual art is, is such an important and just powerful way um, of doing that. Um, I just Googled before the event started, I Googled Juneteenth and I, I Googled flyer and I Googled Black August and I Googled flyer. And I just, I mean, just, I would suggest doing that because it's just beautiful. It's beautiful artwork. There still is that, that color scheme that comes up, but it's, 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 um, it's so amazing how many different ways in which these things kind of impact us and what we share, what our artists share with us. Let me, um, let me Jennifer's a, posting some really great songs, by the way. Thank you. Let me add a, a little to that. Yes. Um, because, like, I, had a, I have a comrade who um, talks about when we adorn ourselves in African attire and African symbols, it's like our political uniform. And it becomes a mechanism to generate conversation. Yes, those earrings. That's exactly <laughs> what I was going to. When, when we started, everybody kept commenting on the earrings, the, the, how beautiful the earrings are. That becomes a mechanism for you to say, well, do you know what these symbols, what these earrings represent? Do you know about the Dinkra symbols? You, you follow me? So therefore the visual arts 
becomes a means for us to actually make our people more conscious of the situation that we're in. They become actual political statements. They actually become means of saying that we are here on our own terms, and this is how we want to be seen within the world. Can I just explain the earrings too? Because I think that's such yes. an important entry point. So, so these are Adinkra symbols. Um, Adinkra are, there's symbols with soul teachings. Adinkra really refers to teachings that, you know, are informing the human soul. And according to the Akan people of what is now modern day Ghana. And I, I love these earrings. Um, I love the whole Adinkra symbol system. There are so many different symbols. What I always kind of focus on and why we focus on these African symbols is a, again, affirming African humanity, ideology, political ideas that existed in our bodies before we got here. We weren't mind erased when we got off the ships, right? We had cultural heritage, cultural technologies. Um, we had concepts like democracy before we got to America. America didn't teach us those things. There's a, an Adinkra symbol for democracy that's hundreds of years old, right? And so when we, when we understand that there's a, there's a framework and there's an understanding of freedom and a concept of humanity that predates all of the madness, um, it's, it's empowering to refer to those symbols and refer to those understandings because those continue to guide our movements, right? And help us define ourselves and see ourselves clearly. Um, we have some more really good questions. I didn't want to skip Skip them. Why are some African countries changing their flags to blue, red, white? Um, Cape Verde is an interesting, an interesting situation um, because, as as the person may have noted, most African national flags do have the red, black, and green color scheme um, because of this this same idea and paying tribute to a process that Garvey started um, at the turn of at the beginning of the twentieth century. But I'm not sure about the changing of the colors. Do you know anything about that? I know nothing about it. Um, okay. Um, so we have uh, uh, several questions about surveillance in our current movement, in the Black Lives Matter movement. I do want to address that before we go on. Um, to what extent are we infiltrated? You know, what, you know, are the same things that happened to the folks in the 60s and 70s and 80s still going on now, do you think? Yes, I think. Um, uh, the, the 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 nutshell answer is yes all right mm -hmm. um but it doesn't mean that we don't organize it doesn't mean that we don't do this work it just means that we do it knowing that we're being surveilled i already mentioned um to um i mentioned earlier about you know the fbi and other you know law enforcement agencies going through people's social media accounts looking for things that can be used against them to say that they're trying to incite riots and things of that that nature so we know that that takes place we also know that within, you know, certain organizations that there are people who are in there. When you want to talk about, you know, the UNIA, well, we need to know that the first black person to be a part of the FBI was sent to infiltrate the UNIA. So this thing has been going on for, 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 for a long time. We know that these people exist. We know that they attempt to infiltrate organizations, but a good organization and a good organizer hopefully is able to be mindful of what's going on. And it's not foolproof, but there needs to be mechanisms in place where you are able to, 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 to know when you might be infiltrated and what to do after that. But I think the thing is that sometimes we allow for the possibility of infiltration and the possibility of surveillance to stop us from doing what we're doing. Like, listen, this is on Zoom right now. Like, you realize <laughs> that somebody who is not connected to what we're trying to talk about politically and ideologically is watching this and is probably attempting to take some type of information to be used against somebody. It's the reality of the situation that we're in, but it doesn't mean that we don't continue to do this work. So bravery is on the table. It's, it's either, it's, 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 no, it's be being able to acknowledge the risks and move forward or not, right? Um, and and that's a, and obviously that's an individual choice. Obviously, it's something we should discuss and think about. Um, and everyone's got to make that choice, you know. About right, how... and it, it doesn't mean that you're like you know stupid about the decisions that you make. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're actually extremely more conscious of the decisions that you make and the places that you're at and the people that you. Yeah, you're mindful of all that stuff. 
And that's something we, we should do in life in general, like be discerning and, <laughs> and, and try to go into situations with our eyes open, as they say. Um, um, next question I saw from Fiona, how do you feel about the more pop cultural black stories which are now being told? Uh, TV shows like Blackish and Watchmen or films like Black Panther, do you think these help advance recognition of black political causes or hinder them? I think that they help start a conversation. Like, and th this is like, for me, like I, I don't watch that much stuff in pop culture, um, but I do believe that they begin to start a conversation. So we can use Black Panther in order to connect people to understanding about traditional African culture, spirituality within Africa, to deal with the relationship between African people and the earth. Like you use that as a point of departure, then yes, that's necessary. But to think that you're gonna watch something and like, you know, figure what the heck is going on? Nah, man, it ain't that simple. You need to read and you need to talk to some elders. You need to talk to people and have conversations with people because it's the conversations that bring meaning, probably more than some of the movies that are put out because the movies that are put out can't tell the true story. They're only gonna tell snippets. I mean, we all, we're, we're clearly aware of this uh, narrative that's coming out about Fred Hampton and we know that that narrative that's coming about, uh, about coming about regarding Fred Hampton comes from the perspective of the person who was complicit in seeing him get murdered. Uh -huh. So, you know, I, I, I think that there are parts, there are points of, uh, points of departure. So I remember when um, uh, Beyonce did that Super Bowl uh, presentation and, you know, making connections back to the, to, to the Panthers. And I was like, all right, this is a start. You take that and then go read about some Panthers. Go find these Panthers that are still alive in New York and New Jersey, all throughout California, Chicago and Texas, and talk to them and figure out what the, what the Panthers were about, as opposed to just watching Beyonce do her thing and then thinking that you know what the Panthers were about. The Panthers were much more complicated than wearing black leather jackets and have a fist in the air and having an afro. Right. Okay, so we've got um, kind of more cultural questions. Um, um, a couple of questions really related to the role of white people in, in, in cultural appreciation and also in the current movement for Black Lives. And um, maybe somewhat relatedly, maybe not, how do we get, in, get folks involved who aren't really on this page, aren't really at this spectrum, uh, at this end of the political spectrum? and aren't really trying to engage in these kinds of conversations. You, so, you, you know, I'm gonna, need the, I'm gonna need the questions one at a time. I'm, one, okay, so, so white folks and, and the role of white people in, in having, you know, African art, et cetera, um, and actually participating in the movement for black lives. Um, so listen, I think that the art cultural thing is not necessarily the same as participating in black in, in, in this BLM stuff. So we'll yeah. deal with the cultural stuff. Um, African art, African attire, African names, all that stuff is African. And it is a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's part of the connection that we as people of African descent have. And it helps us define who we are in relation to the place that we are in right now. And if we have people who are not African, participating, manipulating, adorning themselves with this stuff, to me, it's inauthentic. And like, you know, I deal with, I have, I have a number of white students and I tell them like, you know, in order to go home, you need to go through your own historical cultural experience. You don't jump straight back to the African experience because that's what a lot of folks like to do. They're like, oh, well, I'm gonna figure this stuff out, you know, I'm gonna wear this dashiki, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. It's not as simple as that. There's a, you study the work of Sheikh Anta Diab, Sheikh Anta Diab will tell us how we got from the African to the European, so forth and so on. You need to follow that line. And therefore, you know, that's my position. As it relates to white folks in the context of BLM, um, as long as they're not in leadership positions, well, I don't see what the problem is. And that's like the nutshell response to the answer. Um, Black Lives Matters is concerned with hopefully transforming this whole nation, which includes white people. They have a role to play. They just 
I don't believe need to be controlling and directing the project. Okay. Next question. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I wanted to actually jump in on a point that you made that is really, really important. And that is the question of power in culture and the power in leadership of movements. Um, when folks ask me about this, this question, I'm always kind of concerned with power dynamics, right? Um, we're not in a place where wearing a dashiki is a neutral, valueless act. It is a declaration of culture. When having black art in your home and having pictures of black people on your wall and wearing black clothing and African clothing literally can devalue the market value of your home. If people come to look at your house and it, it's a hundred thousand, y'all saw this it's in the news recently. If it if your house is valued appraised at a hundred thousand dollars less when there are black cultural artifacts in your home, as as opposed to when you remove them and essentially whiten your household then it is a political, it is a, it is, there's a power dynamic at work, yes. right? And that's why these things matter. And I think that's why black people tend to be very protective of their culture because we're dealing with a group of people who has historically appropriated and stolen um, and taken leadership and ownership over cultures that do not belong to them. And so having sensitivity around that is important. That's all I'll say about that. There's, there's sensitivity around the power dynamics at work and how you either challenge those power dynamics or wittingly or unwittingly reinforce those power dynamics through your actions. So yeah. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um, we got some, some, you know, some cosigns about how our, our expressions define our culture and affirm our humanity. Um, Gwen, I would agree that the deep roots in democracy um, have something to do with why we keep holding America's feet to the fire about democracy. I think so, also some of that is America's claims that it is a democratic nation and us trying to essentially ask America to do what it says it will do. Uh, how do we control our narrative so that the Black narrative is not co-opted? That's kind of a broad question. But, um, I, I, but I, I, that, that it is broad, but I think it's a good question, yeah. especially in relation to this year's Juneteenth celebration. Okay. Like what I saw going on was everybody and their mother from every white group trying to share with us what Juneteenth was and how important it was. And when we have mainstream society take that which is ours and control it, control the narrative, it, it, it's extremely problematic. I think also we need to recognize that there is a financial component to this. So we're going to have Juneteenth flags, Juneteenth um, t-shirts, Juneteenth this, Juneteenth that. We need to make sure that we're purchasing this material and these goods from Black-owned companies because all too, all too often these companies are not Black-owned. So there is a, we, we should be mindful, yes, with the, 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 the narrative, but also the products and how that financial component can be used to disrupt our, our, our stability as, 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 as African people. As it relates to the narrative, how do we control it? We control it by having conversations like these. We control it by having um, the, the, the African American Studies Institute. That's how we control it. Africana Studies as an academic discipline is there to hopefully control these types of dialogues so that we can make sure that we are, you know, steering this ship properly so that we, we are very clear, very clear that if there's an issue, we need to go to this African-American studies department and program. And we do that and we make sure that we're talking to the right folks. We're not just running to some random person who might be teaching in some academic unit, but we're going to scholars who have training and who have commitments to black studies. That's how we control the narrative. Um, I, um, I have a question uh, of my own. <laughs> Um, are there other um, Black holidays that we should be thinking about? Like, what are your thoughts on Kwanzaa? What are your thoughts on, um, I don't know, if there are other kind of specifically Black holidays? Or maybe even, can you speak about the existence of like a, a Black approach to more mainstream holidays, like Labor Day's coming up? So I, I'll, I'll, what do we do? I'll talk about um, Kwanzaa. Um, because that's easy for, to, to, to talk about. Um, I, I 
have been resistant to Kwanzaa. I was resistant to Kwanzaa um, for a number of reasons. But when I started doing work inside these correctional facilities and I saw how these brothers understood Kwanzaa and how they used Kwanzaa as a means of forming, developing, and advancing their consciousness, it made me rethink my critiques of Kwanzaa, the originator, and all that other political nonsense connected. Um, so I, you know, now help support projects around Kwanzaa, and I think that it's useful, but I think we also need to be mindful, living in a capitalist nation, that people have the ability to try to make money off of our holidays. And that's the, that, that's what I, what I grapple with. Um, I grapple with that in regards to all holidays. Like, you know, I don't, I'm not the biggest fan of birthdays because I think that every day that we wake up, we should be celebrating our life. Why we got to celebrate the day that we actually came in, you know? So that's, that, that's my position as it relates to, um, to, to, to Kwanzaa. That was the question I said I was going to take. I don't remember any of the others. Oh, uh, about Black approaches to mainstream holidays, like Labor Day, for instance, and being that we were brought here as laborers, I think that's a um, kind of a, in some of the places I've been in, in this country, you know, Labor Day tends to be a really important holiday. Um, is there a Black approach to Labor Day or but, all right, so Memorial I think, Day? Or, I think the Black approach to every holiday is to remind us that to remind us of our experience in relation to this holiday. So for instance, July 4th, whenever July 4th comes for me, Frederick Douglass, to what, to the, to, to what, to the slave, what is the 4th of July? That is the first thing on my radar. And I think that for every single holiday, we need to place ourselves at the center. As you mentioned, you know, Labor Day is coming. All right. And we came here as labor. We need to push that to the center of the, of the, of the dialogue. That's my approach to, to, to mainstream holidays. And it's an approach that we need to bring to understanding our existence. We should, dare, every day, we need to be reminded of who we are. And when we have holidays where people think it's about having a cookout, okay, we can have a cookout, but we can also talk about why we're here in the first place. Okay. And, and I think we do. I think, you know, people might be surprised at some of the conversations that are had at cookouts and among family members. It's a time for planning. And again, always has been. Christmas, um, the wintertime holidays, we can go back to Harriet Tubman freeing her brothers around Christmas time and really taking advantage of these holidays as just opportunities to gather, opportunities okay. to convene and have important conversations and make important plans for our futures. Um, so someone raised a question about what are the thoughts about well, since we're on it, Thanksgiving, um, I have, you know, obviously I have some thoughts about Thanksgiving, um, but I, this is your show. This is no, your show. I will let you, I will let you handle that. <laughs> go ahead. If I, if necessary, I'll come back around, but go ahead. Again, I'm going, I'm going back to all the caveats at the beginning about my thoughts and Dr. Carol's thoughts not representing, you know, the, the people who sponsor. <laughs> 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 we jumped right into the deep end with our first event, guys. Thank you so much for still being with us and hanging with us. Um, but I think Thanksgiving is, um, for, for me and my family, our observance is, um, we observe a national day of mourning. We stand in solidarity with the indigenous people of this land and we celebrate the way they celebrate. Um, also particularly because we have native ancestors, um, in our family, in our direct bloodline. So that's what that day means to us. It's an opportunity to, um, to stand in solidarity with another group that is struggling with colonization and the theft of land and, and et cetera. Um, so, and it's, so again, it's an opportunity to educate, raise awareness um, and, and show solidarity. Um, so again, the culture, cultural as political. Um, someone. Can I add something really quickly? Sure. Not necessarily for, um, for Thanksgiving, but actually for Columbus Day. Okay. Um, for the last few years, I don't know how many, um, a group um, called Decolonize This Place has done an anti-Columbus Day tour at the American Museum of Natural History. And I have gone to this tour and I have taken students on this tour and it is a way that we can resist the narrative of Columbus as this great person who discovered so much, so forth and so on. 
I'm going to shoot a link that um, is an article dealing with it. But again, that's a way that I think that we can celebrate and engage these holidays that contradict our existence and are connected to our oppression. We highlight that reality. That's how we, that's how we do it. Yeah. Um, ag agreed. I think um, there are some more questions. Um, I guess, yeah, I think that's really important. I think I want to, I want to put this question on the table about capitalism and racism. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to separate capitalism from racism? Um, or is a capitalist system racist by default? So, I mean, we should all do a little quick Google search on racial capitalism um, and understand that this concept, these two concepts arguably can't be separated. I think that, you know, we need to understand racism, but we also need to understand the economic components connected to to racism but what happens all too many times is that when we separate them that we're not allowed to have a clearly racial analysis of capitalist oppression and because we can't have that this is why racial capitalism as a concept becomes so 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 important look at the work of robin dg kelly um look at the work of why am i the author of black marxism wow cedric robinson there's a body of scholars who've done a, a, a litany of, of, of pieces around racial capitalism. So yes, we have to recognize that they are connected and separating them um, actually won't allow us to really disrupt the whole system because the system that we exist within is one that revolves around issues of racial exploitation, um, uh, economic exploitation, gendered exploitation, exploitation in relation to, to sexual orientation, so forth and so on. And these systems are linked. And I'm not sure I would, I would, um, yeah, so these, these systems are linked. That's what I would. Okay, so, um, and a, a follow-up question, and I think this is something that I get a lot. Um, it's about, um, is it possible to, you know, be pro-Black and also kind of be capitalist in your orientation? Can that work? Is there space for that? Or, or you know, should we be leaning into and kind of participating more greatly in capitalism? Should that be the goal? So I'm, I'm not going to touch that question, but I will say I believe <laughs> okay. that, you have somebody, you, that you have somebody coming on that will be able to talk about that question. Don't, don't you have uh, somebody... Yeah, I, 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 Jared will probably touch on that at I'm, some point. I'm pretty sure that he will handle that much more thoroughly than I will. <laughs> I'm not even going to touch it, but um, I'll be, I'll be there for that. So. <laughs> okay, great. Um, um, uh, question about, um, I, I guess we're, we're returning to the question of kind of white folks who want to honor the culture, support the culture, support artists and educate kids um, and raise the question on a middle school and a high school level. What, what is who, the, who should bring this up? Do they have the, do white educators have to have the, should they be doing this work in classrooms? And I've been asked that question as, as well. I mean, personally. listen, when 85% when, when of the folks in public schools, sorry, I mean, when 85% when of public school educators are white women, yeah, they have to be sharing this information with our students, but they need to make sure that they're sharing it correctly. And they need to make sure that they're sharing it, you know, with the, with the right foundation, maybe it's up to them to say, "Hold up, I'm going to have this person come into my school." I have form, I have students who are who are who are have former students who are teachers, and I go into their schools all the time talking about this information. So yes, they need to do it, but maybe they need to bring other voices in, and as they bring the voices in, they can do that work, and it's not left up to some white teacher to try to control a, 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 a narrative. Because that goes back to what, what the previous question was. Right. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, bringing in the Black community to speak and teach. Obviously, um, being a teacher is, is in some ways uh, having a platform, right? And having a, a heavy influence and in shaping the thoughts, the thinking of young people um, and, pe and other people who are in our, in our classroom. Uh, and so allowing the people that you that you seek to to ally yourself with 
to speak for themselves um, is, is critical to, again, adjusting and, uh, and addressing and being sensitive to that power dynamic. And I'm, I'm um, just going to add, yeah. not necessarily from the question of white teachers, but I have taught at various schools and I have worked to bring in former political prisoners into my classes because we're reading about them, but hold up, bring them there and allow them to speak for themselves. And then one of my mentors said to me, well, yeah, well, I'm not going to be going to speak at all these places. I'm telling you so that you can do that, so you can do that work. But the point is this, if we, if we have the opportunity to bring in voices, bring them in. We don't need to control the dialogue. It's about discussion and alternative voices. So my last question is about the pandemic and how this changes the dynamic. Um, Obviously, we're, we're dealing with a national crisis, an international crisis, but in some ways there are opportunities, right? I get to bring you in and you're not in this area. We get to reach out and have global voices. It's easier now to bring in voices into our classrooms um, than perhaps it has been before. Um, so really there's no excuse to not do it, right? We just gotta find the folks and, and, make, and, and get them online and get them on, on camera and get their voices out there. But um, I, I kind of wanna talk about, um, how, and this is just off the cuff, what do you think celebrating these Black holidays or celebrating Blackly, what's that going to look like in the context of COVID, in the context of a global pa pandemic where we're on lockdown and we can't get together and have a cookout and we can't always get together and have, you know, a political education rally or something like that? Um, I, so as an organizer with um, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, all throughout this month of, of August, we have had a variety of webinars that are doing the work that we would be doing if we were face to face. You know, I've mentioned before the work that I do um, in the, the, the New York City chapter of MXGM as it relates to, the, to, to the, the Black August Study Group. We're doing that through Zoom. So I think that actually to a certain extent, as you stated, um, the technology has allowed for us to continue to do the work, but also reach further than we would be do, reach further than, than we would have been doing this any other way. You look at the people who are on here. We have people from Oregon. We got people from Sydney. We got people from everywhere. You follow? So we're actually reaching out to more people. But I also will be, have us be mindful that we got people on here who are probably not here for the same reasons. And those people who ain't here for the same reasons it is what it is. Infiltration is real. <laughs> we, need to, we need to deal with that. Um, but, but we should be extremely mindful that we can use these mechanisms. So <clears throat> um, prior to the pandemic, I was doing um, these teaching workshops with the American Friends Service Committee in their Prison Watch program. And we then started to move them onto Zoom. All right. I do um, also, you know, with some of the faculty members at Baruch College, we've done some um, Friday afternoon discussions around race and social justice in the midst of Zoom. So like, we're even though we're in COVID, that doesn't mean, like our oppression does not stop because of a pandemic. The reality is that our, uh, the, 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 the reality is that our understanding of our oppression becomes even more clearer. And it should be the reason why we say that we got more work to do. And, and, and ultimately, what we're going to find is we're going to do what we've always done, which is be creative and be resourceful and, and utilize whatever tools that we can to, to, um, to continue the work. Um, I am going to very uh, quickly ask if there are any final questions that they put, you put them in the chat now. Um, and I'd like to thank you, Dr. Carol, for your energy. I know we're both used to projecting to very large classrooms full of oh, so people. I'm like, I'm, I'm that loud? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it is what it is. But, um, but I thank you so much for, for sharing your enthusiasm, your, your, your passion for the struggle, the work, and just exposing us to, um, to a politic that we don't get to hear and see and witness and engage with a lot. Thank you to all of the participants. You all have been great. I mean, I've literally felt the energy in the chat, um, the desire to, to do this work, to engage with these ideas and with this culture. Um, I, I mean, we're, I cannot believe how 
how far reaching this has been. <laughs> this was just going to be me and, you know, 20 people. And, and it's really grown. I thank you so much. Um, the universe kind of generally has a way of bringing people together uh, and, and it just does what it's supposed to do. I trust that um, wholeheartedly. Um, I look forward to uh, seeing some of you again, most of you, all of you come back again uh, next month when we have a discussion about black hair. Mm. It's, 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 uh, we have Dr. Fia Mbili Shaka. She's a psychologist, she's a hairstylist, um, and she is going to talk about um, how important it is. It's not just, you know, it's not just cute. It's not just creative. It is, it is also deeply meaningful. Um, so it'll have a different tone. It'll have a different tone uh, next week, but also very vital, very, just very important. I thank you, Prince George's Community College, for supporting me and the African American Studies Institute. Um, everyone, please stay safe. Um, please stay healthy. <clears throat> we bid you peace if you're willing to fight for it, <laughs> right? In the words of our brother Jared and others before him. Um, more, any more questions before we, before we log out? And I'm just going to say thank you to <clears throat> Dr. Cheller. Thank you to the African American Studies Institute. Thank you to um, Prince George's County Community College for giving me this opportunity. And thank you to all the folks <clears throat> who've participated, asked questions, affirmed what I was talking about, and just trying to like have this move forward. It's a, it's a, a, a very appreciated. And let's continue to fight on. I should. I should. Good night, everyone. Good night.